everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I should first start off by saying that the event is being recorded, but it's not the audience, it's just the speakers and those who will be joining us remotely who are being recorded. Uh, so I'm Professor Tommy White. I am a criminologist at Northumbria University in Newcastle in the United Kingdom. Uh, and this event is being uh, partly sponsored by my current research funding, which is the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. And I had the pleasure of collaborating uh, with the Global Initiative for Transnational Organized Crime, uh, with Ian Tennant and all the folks there at the back, and then also with the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime, um, and Alice is joining us uh, from them today. So we are here just having a very open discussion about illicit wildlife trafficking, how we can actually go about preventing that. And one of the big proposals in this sphere is around an additional protocol to the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime. And to start us off with that discussion, uh, we're going to connect now online to uh, John Scanlon, who is joining us from Geneva. I could do a long introduction of him, but I imagine that you all know him. But he is uh, in various roles um, and right now leading the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime that I mentioned earlier, as well as chair of the Illegal Wildlife Trade Challenge Fund in the UK. Um, and that's just a tiny bit of, of what he's done. But I'm going to turn it over to him now, and he's going to start us off for just about five minutes. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Tanya, and good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to everybody who's joined us today, either in person or in Vienna. Uh, Indiana, or I'd like to say. And a very special welcome to the representatives of member states of the UN Crime Commission who are with us today. Apologies uh, for not being able to join you in person myself. I was in Vienna last week for the UN Crime Commission's expert discussions on crimes that affect the environment, but I was not able to make it back again this week. However, Tanya, along with our good colleague Alice Pasqualato from the End Wildlife Crime, are there in person in Vienna. Let me start by acknowledging Paula Coelho. She's the Secretary of the Environment for Angola, who's joined us for this welcoming session. Paula is one of the most hardworking people I know, and she's an inspiration to all of us. And Paula had a huge workload this year, with so many major meetings having been postponed to 2022. But despite her pressing commitments, she has joined us for the welcoming session, for which we are deeply grateful, and we will hear from Paula in a little while. I'd also like to acknowledge the extraordinary leadership of the President of Angola, His Excellency Jao Lorenzo, who, as Paula will tell us, last September called for a new global agreement to combat wildlife crime, taking the form of an additional protocol under the UNCLOS. In doing so, His Excellency joined with the President of Gabon, His Excellency Ali Bongo and Limba, and the President of Costa Rica, His Excellency Carlos Alvarado Caceda, who jointly called for a new agreement on wildlife crime in May of last year. And just last week, the President of Malawi, His Excellency Dr. Lazarus Makati Chakwera, joined this call through a powerful statement he released on the 16th of February. This visionary call is made by the presidents of four biodiverse rich source countries that are deeply committed to combating wildlife crime. And in their statements, they've recognised that our global agreements and aspirations to protect our biodiversity on land and at sea, tackle climate change, prevent the next pandemic and achieve sustainable development, will not be met unless we seriously scale up our cooperative efforts to tackle wildlife crime. And it is states that make international law. And end wildlife crime's work is orientated around how it can, upon request, Best of all, Angola, Costa Rica, Gabon, and Malawi carry forward the call made by their respective presidents. Support for an additional protocol under the ANTOC has also been expressed by the European Commission in the EU Strategy to Tackle Organised Crime 2021 to 2025. And many individual speakers coming from across all regions have also come forward in support of the protocol, including Ambassador Judy Wakungu. 
Kenya ambassadors to France and former minister for the environment, Dr. Ji Huang Zhang, president of China's Global Environment Institute, Dr. Jorge Cayo, president of the Peruvian Environment and Law Society, the Honorable Lee White, Gabon's Minister for Water, Forest, the Sea and Environment, and Dr. Jane Woodall, amongst many others. Additionally, and Wildlife Crime currently has 26 international champion organizations coming from across all sectors and regions that are supporting calls for such an agreement. These 26 champion organizations include ABM Capital, the African Wildlife Foundation, EMV Vietnam, the Global Coalition to Fight Financial Crime, the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, the International Rangers Federation, the Wildlife Justice Commission, the Wildlife Trust of India, and the World Oceans Council, with the most recent organization to join being the Lilongwe Wildlife Trust of Malawi. And I would also like to recognize the leadership of our host for today, Professor Tanya White, and the Northumbria University for pulling together, uh, pulling together today's event and for inviting in Wildlife Crime and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime to co-sponsor the event with the university. We have a wonderful array of speakers joining us today, and I extend my thanks to everyone who has volunteered their time to be on the panel with us today. In our first session, we will hear about the history and evolution of the UNCLOS, the case for an additional protocol under the Convention on Combating and Preventing Illicit Wildlife Trafficking, the serious threats posed by these crimes and how they converge with other crimes, as well as how such a protocol could apply to marine species. And after a short break, we will return and hear about how international mechanisms for tackling illicit wildlife trafficking are progressing, and we will also have some time for questions. Our good moderator for today, Tanya White, has served as a technical advisor to any wildlife crime since its inception, and I'm sure Tanya will keep us on track as we embark on the most interesting discussion over the coming hours. So with that, on behalf of all of the sponsors and co-sponsors of today's event, welcome, thank you for joining us, and I'll now hand back to you, Tanya, to formally introduce the Secretary of the Environment for Angola. Thank you. Thank you, John. So I see um, that the Secretary, um, Dr. Palazuela, is joining us from Angola, so I will now um, allow her to address Thank you, madam. You may go ahead now. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Tanya, for your introduction and John for your uh, kind words. I'm also sorry I wasn't able to join you today in Vienna, but it is great to see that many of the other colleagues are there in, with you in person. I would like to sincerely thank Norman Cubria University and its partners for hosting this in-depth discussion on such an important topic for Angola. Angola has some of the richest and most diverse wildlife resources of any country in Africa, with iconic species, unique biological diversity, and landscapes. These precious natural resources are severely threatened by the illicit trafficking of wildlife, a form of transnational and organized crime that strips our beautiful country and many others of our natural assets and opportunity for our people to prosper from their sustainable use. We are taking a strong stand against these crimes in Angola, but we cannot hope to end wildlife crimes without also seriously scaling up our international cooperation. Angola is at its firm belief that a new international agreement to prevent and combat wildlife crime is urgently needed to turn the tide of wildlife trafficking which is why we are working hard to advance our country's call for an additional protocol under the UNTOC through the UN Crime Commission, and we will be submitting a draft resolution on the 31st section of the WCPCJ in May 22. As our president, His Excellency John Manuel Gonçalves Lorenzo, said in his speech of September 2021, where he joined the call by the presidents of Costa Rica and Gabon for a new global agreement on wildlife crime, I stated, the time has come for the international community to step up its collective response. The time has come for us to turn the tide on wildlife crime. Close bracket. 
I'm always delighted to see that just last week, the 16th February, the president of Malawi also joined this call with Honorable Excellency Dr. Lazarus McCarthy Makwele, reaffirming once again Malawi's commitment to tackling this critical issue, saying, I state, I am now proud to join the presidents of Costa Rica, Gabon, and Angola in calling for a new international agreement to prevent and combat white life crime. Close quote. I sincerely hope you will also join Angola as well as Costa Rica, Gabon, and Malawi in this important endeavor. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll move now to uh, our next presentation, uh, which is going to be Ian. Uh, kind of is going to give us a bit of background about uh, the UN Transnational Organized Crime Convention. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think you can all hear me without the microphone. Um, and on behalf of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, I'd like to say how it um, really is a pleasure for us to be here in a real in-person meeting again, and more importantly, discussing these important issues. It's part of our purpose and our mandate to encourage and facilitate exactly these kind of discussions on pertinent issues related to transnational organized crime between governments, civil society and academia um, all together. Um, so um, thank you to uh, Dr. White for organizing today and to, the, uh, to Dr. Scanlon and uh, Her Excellency the Minister for the introductory remarks. And as you can see, uh, the issue of illicit wildlife trafficking is rising up the agenda, um, and as well as other types of uh, environmental crimes. And at the Global Initiative, we think this is um, a good thing that it's rising up the agenda. A recent report by the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime um, from 2021, uh, which is available outside the room, uh, on the global illicit um, economy, makes clear the stark impact environmental crime has had on our societies over time. While the exploitation of resources such as oil, valuable minerals and timber is widely reported, there are many other lesser known markets based on the unregulated sale of natural resources. Meanwhile, an estimated 90% of e-waste is traded or dumped illegally. Scarcity in these resources threatens species and natural resources, increasing their value when traded in illegal markets. But clearly, we are not meeting the scale of this challenge, including when it comes to illicit wildlife trafficking. There are already multilateral agendas, such as CITES, uh, which are designed to regulate the international trade in wildlife and wildlife products. And there are also a number of civil society organizations that contribute extensively to aware awareness raising, research, investigations, and even assisting in enforcement in some cases. There are multiple reasons why we haven't been able to tackle this problem effectively. And you can look at poverty, development, law enforcement, capacity, and resources, and importantly, corruption. But one part of the response as part of a holistic strategy that we need to improve is the international legal framework, which, when implemented properly, should give prosecutors and other legal and law enforcement practitioners more tools to put to perpetrators justice. Following previous research reports, the Global Initiative uh, presented at the 2015 UN Crime Congress in Doha a report in collaboration with the World Wildlife Fund, which found that international treaties fail to address environmental crime as a form of transnational organized crime. Instead, they either focus on conservation or international trade aspects. The analysis highlighted that the only global treaty that could provide the needed criminal perspective is the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, the UNTOC. The paper found that the UNTOC could be used as a model in two different ways, as an inspiration for shaping a new international instrument dedicated to transnational environmental organized crime, or as a framework for a new UNTOC protocol dedicated to environmental crimes. And today, the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime will present the case for an additional UNSOC protocol on illegal wildlife trafficking, which they have developed. But before we get into detail on the new protocol, I want to take us back into the history of the UNSOC itself, how it has evolved, and this will help us understand how a new protocol could be part of the story. 
To coincide with the 20th anniversary of the adoption of UNTOC uh, in 2020, we published a report on the history of the Convention. The report concluded that the negotiation and the adoption of the UNTOC clearly demonstrates some significant achievements. The international community grasped the importance of the issue of transnational organized crime, and they took action. The Convention was, and is, a great step forward in terms of giving states new frameworks for criminalizing transnational criminal activity and facilitating international legal cooperation to pursue those undertaking these criminal acts. And this is also the case for the three criminal markets addressed by the existing protocols, human trafficking, human smuggling, firearms trafficking. Whatever you think of the real impact on the ground against these criminal markets, the UNTOC provides a framework which has been used and should be used more as part of a holistic range of political and practical responses to transnational organized crime. Raising awareness um, of the seriousness of the problem, um, a good amount of political will, favorable geopolitics, and personal commitment and interventions ensured the success of the negotiation of the UNSOC as a widely ratified instrument. Despite the widespread skepticism from member states which existed as the process began towards the beginning of the 1990s, UNTOC achieved a consensual adoption by the end of the decade. Going back further, the UN Crime Congresses were beginning, just to give an idea of the scale of time here, the UN Crime Congresses were beginning to recognise the importance of the problems in their declarations and resolutions as far back as 1975 culminating in more concrete changes in the 1990s with the creation of the UN Crime Programme here at the UN um, in Vienna and the CCPCJ, uh, where the resolution will be presented, the first session of which was in 1992. However, the CCPCJ's predecessor committee, the UN Committee on Crime Prevention and Control, whose unpublished declaration for the end of complacency against transnational crime is a striking example of the strength of recognition and feeling emanating from experts at the time. At the same time, policy was developing. Concretely, national and international legal frameworks were being adopted, which would give inspiration to the UNTOC. In the USA, uh, the Italian anti-mafia legislation, and also internationally, the 1988 UN Drug Trafficking Convention. Specific events also played their part in the history. The assassination of Italian anti-mafia judge Falcone, one month after that first TCPCJ session in 1992, by all accounts, stiffen the resolve of the Italian system more than ever to push for a convention. And very relevant for where we are today, geopolitics were very favorable. The fall of the Berlin Wall ushered in a new era of multilateral cooperation. The US position was also very important in this era. It was prioritizing action against organized crime, recognizing it as a national security threat. And alongside that, personal interventions from uh, ministers, from inside the Italian government, inside the UN Secretariat and others uh, made a big difference in paving the way for the adoption by consensus of the UNTOC. But there are challenges. The momentum in support of the convention soon slowed after adoption and widespread ratification. Over subsequent years, while the threat of organized crime did not go away, and at the Global Initiative, we would argue it has increased significantly since the adoption of the UNTOC, political priorities seem to wane, and we are still experiencing the consequences of that loss of political will. Only six years after the adoption of the UNTOC, the then Executive Director of UNODC was publicly castigating member states for lack of visible results in implementation and follow-up. And as we know, the review mechanism was only agreed in 2018. A prevalent view among experts is that UNTOC is not used enough and hasn't done enough to increase the level of international cooperation between countries that don't already cooperate. In many regions, knowledge of UNTOC amongst practitioners is low, and in some places legislation is not actually up to the standards of UNTOC despite ratification and adoption. There are various factors that we can cite as causes for this. For example, soon after the adoption of the UNTOC, counter-terrorism became an international priority, Multilateralism has been in decline, and a new, more prominent convention on corruption uh, was adopted, which some say has overshadowed the UNTOC politically. The problem of transnational organized crime is a complex one that requires cross-cutting responses. 
But here we know that the Conference of Parties is still not well integrated with other related bodies in Vienna, let alone the broader multilateral system. Public awareness of and civic engagement with UNTOP is relatively low, meaning there is little public scrutiny or pressure to hold governments to account on their implementation. And while the UNTOP negotiation process itself included meaningful consultations with civil society, which enriched in the discussions and provided governments with new perspectives, in particular on the human trafficking protocol, in subsequent years, civil society has been effectively frozen out of some discussions. For example, NGOs cannot observe the working groups of the UNTOP, and their role in the review mechanism of the UNTOP is very limited. In conclusion, there is a growing awareness of the importance of illicit wildlife trafficking, and on the proposal for a new UNTOP protocol to counter it which has been promoted by high-level government representatives and civil society organisations. There is no, by no means international consensus on it at this point, but it is right that we discuss it in places like this, here in Vienna, but also with practitioners on the ground. And alongside these discussions, we also need to be discussing how to improve implementation of existing instruments and bolster practical action and cooperation. We need to be aware of the challenges a recent report that we published on the future of international cooperation against transnational organized crime highlighted the geopolitical challenges that we face. But in all of these discussions, open and constructive dialogue between governments and civil society is fundamental. This discussion on an additional protocol provides an opportunity to do just that and improve our response to illicit wildlife trafficking specifically and transnational organized crime more generally. Thank you very much, Ian. I think that sets the stage really brilliantly to, to turn now back to John Scanlon so he can give us some more specifics about what is actually in the protocol that has been um, written, drafted, and, and is up for discussion. Great. Thank you, Tanya. And uh, many thanks to Ian for that uh, excellent overview of the history and evolution of the UNTOP. As uh, just indicated, I'm going to explore the case for an additional protocol on combating and preventing the illicit trafficking of wildlife. And when talking of wildlife, I'm including all fauna and flora, including all fish and tree species, not just the limited number of species that we find listed in other societies. Let me start by briefly looking at some of the consequences of these crimes. Reports from the IPBS, UNEP, UNODC, the World Bank, and the Global Initiative, amongst others, graphically describe the severe environmental consequences of wildlife crime. For our climate, ecosystems, wild animals and plants, as well as your human and animal health. But we also know that the damage goes much deeper than that. We know that these crimes involve the theft of natural resources from local and indigenous communities. They discourage legitimate investors and they undermine the governments of source countries. And they do that by depriving them of revenue, fueling corruption, destroying livelihoods, injuring and killing rangers and creating national and regional security. And Tanya's going to expand upon these issues in her presentation shortly. Over the past 12 years I've spent a lot of time helping to galvanise support amongst countries, law enforcement agencies and many others to combat and prevent wildlife crime. And as CITES Secretary General from 2010 to 2018, I was directly involved in multiple collective efforts to achieve this objective, including establishing, institutionalising and attracting resources for the International Consortium to Combat Wildlife Crime. That's a consortium for CITES Secretariat, Interpol, UN Office of Drugs and Crime, World Customs and World Bank and I had the honour to chair it for its first eight years. It's also involved in working with Gabon and Germany on the first ever UN General Assembly resolution on tackling illicit wildlife trafficking. The United for Wildlife Transport Task Force, the Global Environment Facility and World Bank on creating the Global Wildlife Program, and with UNODC on its first wild, World Wildlife Crime Report back in 2016. Now I'll mention these few select examples as I have seen for myself the progress we've made through this type of international cooperation and national action. And these endeavours have resulted in greater attention and resources being dedicated to the issue, which is encouraging. 
but it's equally clear that these gains are both insufficient and fragile. Notwithstanding these efforts, we are still nowhere near ending wildlife crime. Instead, we see these crimes continue to escalate against a backdrop of rapidly changing environmental, human health and security challenges. Just two weeks ago, park rangers were tragically killed in an ambush in W National Park in Benin. It's a park managed by African parks. They were well-trained and um, well-equipped rangers. And horrific incidents like these are happening far too often. We must better tackle the demand and the trafficking to relieve the pressure on our brave rangers who are serving in the front lines. And this will require much deeper international cooperation and national action across source, transit and destination countries. There comes a point where one must recognise that what is being done is not enough. And our current international criminal law framework is not fit for purpose in addressing today's environmental realities, especially as it relates to the scourge of wildlife crime. Now, CITES is often referred to as providing some form of legal framework, but it's limited in scope and it was not designed to deal with wildlife crime. It's a 50-year-old trade-related convention, not a crime-related convention. It does not apply to states to criminalise breaches of the convention. It only applies to the cross-border movement of wildlife, but not, for example, to illegal harvesting or poaching, and it applies to a limited number of species. CITES obliges the parties to create management and scientific authorities, not enforcement authorities. And it is not a natural forum for the enforcement or wider criminal justice community. But in the absence of any alternative at the time, we make the best possible use of CITES to help galvanise international cooperation and national action. It is an important convention and it does have a role to play. But CITES does not provide the international legal framework we need and a comprehensive, legally binding regime for tackling wildlife crime within the framework of international criminal law rather than trade law is beyond the scope of science. We must address all species that are being trafficked, not just the 38,000 species listed under CITES, which is just 0.5% of the world's 8 million species. And the UN World Wildlife Crime Report notes that millions of species that are not listed by CITES may be illegal illegally harvested and traded, especially tin root fish. It makes no sense to only pay attention to a limited number of species, and usually only once they are threatened with extinction, especially when one looks at the scale, nature and consequences of fisheries and forestry crime. We must shake up the status quo, which is inadequate to meet current challenges, and make transformative changes to our system if we want to change course. As I alluded to earlier, there are many disparate, non-binding resolutions and initiatives in this area, all of which are very good in their own right, but they've not generated the level of political support, engagement of relevant agencies at all levels, the necessary financial and human resources, or national action that is required to end wildlife crime. And there is no global centre of gravity for advancing cooperative efforts to combat and prevent wildlife crime, or for reviewing the progress that's being made. We must now embed both combating and preventing wildlife crime where it belongs, namely into the international criminal law framework, with the UNODC, the Convention to Post, the UN Crime Commission and the UN Vienna Duty Station leading a global cooperative, coordinated effort, including in reviewing progress. A binding legal agreement under the UNCLOS will provide an enduring global platform that will act as a catalyst for heightened international cooperation and national action both of which desperately needed, and a forum for the regular review of progress. And if adopted, the protocol would be the first time that a crime that has an effect on the environment is directly addressed through the International Criminal Law Network, framework, sorry, and be the first global legally binding instrument to include an agreed definition on wildlife crime. And as with the protocol on trafficking in person, such a definition could facilitate a convergence in national approaches regarding the establishment of domestic criminal offences that would support efficient international cooperation in investigating and prosecuting wildlife trafficking cases. And I've drawn from the UN ODC in making that statement, and it is something that Legal Atlas, an international champion with end wildlife crime, has also identified for its work in reviewing national legislation. The content of a protocol is something that states would determine through an intergovernmental negotiating process. However, a protocol would include specific obligations 
on how states will work together to both combat and prevent these crimes. And drawing upon the three existing UNCLOS protocols, as well as national legislation from many countries, including Australia, China, Mexico, Mozambique, and the US, as well as the UNODC Guide on Drafting Legislation to Combat Wildlife Crime, and Wildlife Crime has, in order to help facilitate the discussion, outlined some of the provisions that could be contemplated. Now, as mentioned earlier, states could, through a protocol, agree on a definition of wildlife crime and on a wide range of obligations to both prevent and combat such crimes. It could, for example, set out the conduct that is to be criminalised and cover any species of wild fauna or flora, including fish and timber species, that is protected under any international or, importantly, any national law and address the harvesting, taking, possession, purchase, import or export or introduction from the sea of illicitly traded wildlife. And it could oblige states who, who sign the protocol to make it a criminal offence to import any wildlife or wildlife product into a country if it has been acquired in contravention of the national laws of the source country, representing a remarkable expression of comity between nations or a mutual respect for one another's laws. But address the role and responsibility of the carriers of contraband, oblige the verification of the legitimacy and validity of documents, including any documents suspected of being misused, put obligations on cooperation on training and technical assistance, to raise public awareness and take measures to discourage demand, on sharing information, such as on known groups active in illicit trafficking, on their concealment methods and known transport routes, and legislative experiences and practices and obligations on sharing forensic samples, and to consider measures that will permit the denial of entry or revocation of visas of persons implicated in the commission of events. Now, since we did this preliminary work, some other suggestions have been made by the many states and organisations we have interacted with, such as to include obligations relating to the protection of environmental defenders and whistleblowers, and on the return of seized and confiscated contraband to the source country. And finally, a protocol would automatically trigger all of the tools available under the UNCTAD, which Ian has outlined so well. And it would fall under the review mechanism recently adopted the Convention and its protocols. It would do so without requiring states to make all such offences punishable by four years imprisonment or more. And this would reflect the desirability of providing for a broader range of penalty options for such crimes based on the value of the contraband and the level of harm caused, including community service orders, restitution, paying damages and fines, as well as imprisonment. As mentioned in my welcoming remarks, the presidents of Angola, Costa Rica, Gabon and Malawi have made a powerful united call for a new protocol. And we heard just earlier from Paulo Coelho, the Secretary of the Environment for Angola, who has issued a personal and passionately relayed the views of her president. And today I've briefly outlined what such a protocol could address. And I'm sure there are many other good ideas out there about what it could contain. If negotiations proceed, it will be for states alone to determine the content of the protocol. Colleagues, it's the local and indigenous communities living amongst wildlife, legitimate investors and the governments of source countries, as well as our global biodiversity, climate, health and security that should benefit from the world's wildlife and not organised criminals. Achieving that aspiration is in everyone's interest, and if states decide to make the best use of UNCTOP in tackling wildlife crime, it will go a long way towards making that aspiration a reality. Thank you, Tanya.
But part of that conversation, I think, has to be why is it we need to? Why is it such a global urgent threat that, as uh, we've heard um, from John and from um, the sec Madam Secretary as well? Now, these are some figures that you, you all might have heard already. So, uh, E.O. Wilson, who recently passed away, a conservation biologist, he had documented that extinction is a hundred to a thousand times higher uh, because of human activity than in previous years, uh, in previous decades or centuries even. So people are having a huge impact on the fellow species on the planet. And a big part of that is habitat loss, obviously. Uh, we're taking up more and more space for agriculture is a huge one, but also dams, other infrastructure, cities, uh, all of these different human activities. But as you may have heard, the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services back in 2019, they point to the fact that the second biggest cause for the possible extinction and loss of biodiversity is overexploitation and the illegal wildlife trade. So it's this very issue that we're talking about today. It's the second reason why we're losing all of the other species. So both of these combined human pressures, uh, the IPDES have said notice that there's probably nearly a million species that we might lose in the next decades. Um, and that's a tremendous amount of, of loss. And as we've heard, the main instrument right now of dealing, at least with the international portion of that trade, is CITES. And as I found in, in my research, uh, as I mentioned, um, where I think, yes, it's laudable that CITES has been going for so long, 45 years, and it's an amazing accomplishment to have it ratified and to have so many members, with 183 parties signing on to it. Even after all of that time, it isn't as good as it could be or should be. Uh, only about 50% of the parties have legislation that actually uh, implement the convention to its fullest. Um, by the four criteria uh, that CITES itself has laid out through its national legislation project. And then even those that are implementing it um, aren't necessarily criminalizing it, as we heard um, from John Scanlon, because CITES doesn't require criminalization, it just requires penalization of whatever uh, is a violation. And part of my research found, too, th that CITES, uh, that, that parties aren't necessarily engaging with it to, its, to the, the, the maximum that they could. Um, so I'm sure you're all aware that every two years, CITES asks for uh, what used to be called the biennial report, which is essentially an implementation report. So feeding back to the CITES secretariat about how is it going, how is implementation going. Um, I was really surprised to find in my own research that 67 parties have never completed that report. And so there's this real gap in knowledge of, of even how CITES is implemented. And so we um, can see that it's not probably doing the, the full job that it needs to. And so I agree with Ian, as he said earlier, it, there does need to be a discussion about how else can we actually stop this slide into mass kinds of extinction. So I mentioned around, so this category one, only about 50% of, of members, parties, legislation actually with the full implementation. So that means they have a scientific and a management authority, uh, they penalize violations, they confiscate uh, illegal wildlife that is found um, in there. So there's, and that's just the, the, I find that it's just a real limited kind of look at the implementation. It doesn't go much more deeply than, the, than those kinds of uh, criteria. And then you can see um, there's still 36 members that don't have any they don't even have a scientific authority in some countries still. So, so there's still um, lots of problems even after the 45 years. And I mentioned around, around the reports. There's only 15 parties who have actually completed all of the reports that have been required since 2003. And, the, and what I'd like to, to, to talk through is, I mean, John really got into the, the environmental and I mentioned around the loss of biodiversity. But we should be concerned about wildlife trafficking for other environmental reasons, too. Um, one of those is invasive species, which um, I saw some criticism of this language recently that um, we should really be uh, 
changing the language around invasive to be to, to really indicate that this is human brought species. And this isn't uh, species who have managed to get to a new environment and, and on their own. That, that, that this is a result of human activity. And we see these impacts uh, in various parts of the world. Um, I believe somebody from Australia is here, and we know about invasive species from Australia of, of cane toads and rabbits and foxes and, and those kinds of things. So we know that trade can have these really impactful uh, influence on our ecosystems, um, not just from human consumption, but the impact of new species arriving in, into the ecosystems. And then speaking to a room full of people with masks, disease transmission. It's, uh, it is part, part of the discussion around wildlife trafficking, and there's an ongoing discussion about how much wildlife trade uh, is linked to diseases like COVID, um, but that there, we do know that there are zoonoses, and, and we see that um, with mink farms, for instance, I think is a, is a huge example of that, of, of the, uh, not of the spill over, as we call it, but the spill back. What if mink then give COVID or other diseases back to humans? It is a is part of the conversation when we're talking about wildlife trade. Though I would advocate that we do need a, a lot more uh, information about that. Um, I'd also move on to I mean I'll leave the environmental impacts on there though. But what about economic impacts too? Is that we do have issues with uh, and John alluded to it around. What are the impacts on governments when you have illegal wildlife trade that has circumvented all of the taxes, duties, and revenues uh, that should be generated from that? And if we include timber, and we should include timber in wildlife trafficking conversations, this is a huge amount of revenue loss. There's some estimates that 30 to 90 percent of timber could be illegal, and that's a huge amount of revenue. At some point, and, and it's been some time ago, in Indonesia it was expected that billions of US dollars were lost every year because of, of timber trafficking. And I don't think that we should miss out on, on the individual human aspect of that as well. Of what about uh, human livelihoods that are lost out because of wildlife trafficking? And I think that that is, um, there's often a tension, at least in my experience of research around wildlife trade, about the about the human and, and the wildlife. But we need to, to, to go for social justice and species justice. It does have to be a combination of both. And so we do have to be concerned about human livelihoods. Uh, that, that is a big part of this. But there's, I think, also other human impacts uh, that we should be concerned about when we look at wildlife trafficking. Um, and I think um, my colleague who will speak next, Don Banu, can speak more to this of, of the uh, physical insecurities that people in spaces where wildlife trafficking has happened might be um, subjected to, of organized criminal groups coming in, timber traffickers, um, are they forcing, coercing, or physically threatening local people in these neighborhoods? So wildlife trafficking has, has these larger implications for human security too that, that can often be overlooked. And then I've seen some really recent um, interesting discussions around uh, uh, so UNESCO, one of our other conventions, talks about uh, cultural heritage being a crime, and that's something that can go into the international criminal courts. But what about natural heritage? And can we think of wildlife as our natural heritage? Uh, it's so ingrained in our cultures and our traditions and in our communities. And so when you're facing all of this loss of biodiversity and extinctions, that's a real loss to human culture uh, in many places. And, and then there are other reasons that we should be combating it, focusing on it, because uh, it is a, a, a different kind of loss beyond biodiversity. And then finally, I, I'll just uh, end on the idea of, of the links to national security. And, I, and I'll mostly let my colleague who's speaking next, Don, talk about the, the convergence with other crimes. But I've written uh, quite extensively about uh, how corruption is so uh, ingrained with how wildlife trafficking actually functions. Wildlife trafficking wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for corruption. It's a core facilitator in many parts of the world. Uh, and we know that corruption uh, is really intricately also linked to poverty and that people are kept impoverished because often 
they are surrounded by corruption and can't actually um, overcome that in, in the spaces that they live. We, uh, we have the links to organized crime, um, which I said uh, we'll hear more about maybe in just a moment. Uh, but also then we have um, the discussion, and it came up last week uh, for those of you who were at the expert panels on uh, crimes that affect the environment, of possible links to terrorism and insurgency and these other kinds of threats to human communities. Uh, and, I, and I agree that this can sometimes, the evidence of this can be tenuous at times, um, but I think we do know uh, for certain elements of wildlife trafficking that, that we know that this does happen. Uh, one of the ex recent examples, and, and Jorge Rios uh, gave it last week, is around charcoal. Charcoal is really run by uh, militias uh, in parts of Africa, and, and that disrupts the rule of law and again threatens human security and individual local people who are, who are caught up in, in these kind of crime landscapes. Uh, so, whereas this move, terrorism insurgency might be somewhat over exaggerated, uh, we shouldn't lose sight of it and we should um, remember to, to keep looking for them. So, I, I just wanted to present sort of that bigger picture of of why is this a, a significant topic that we should be talking about? What are the, the global issues that make it so urgent? And it, and it is an environmental issue, but it's also an economic, human, and national security issue as well. So I'm going to leave it there and uh, turn it over to my colleague, Don, who's going to talk much more about how he, how he has evidence from his amazing field work around the world, uh, how wildlife trafficking is actually converging with other kinds of my name is Dan van Bloem. I'm a criminologist from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And um, I conducted uh, research on the illegal wildlife trade uh, during my PhD. Uh, but since then, I'm actually interested in this topic. Um, I also would like to talk a bit about the diversification of organized crime into the illegal trade in natural resources, um, including wildlife trafficking, to have a better understanding of how organized crime um, actually appears to be present in particular regions in the world in relation to illegal wildlife trade. Um, in line with, uh, with the points of uh, my uh, dear colleague, uh, Professor Tanya Wyatt, um, I also would like to emphasize that um, there are a lot of significant direct and indirect um, environmental and social harms related to the illegal wildlife trade to human and non-human entities, including um, affected uh, ecosystems, uh, disrupted ecosystem functions, um, side effects including zoonotic diseases, um, as well as the direct harms to animals. Um, and in addition to that, there is a diver diverse area of harms to local communities that actually suffer because of organized crime activities in their environment. In addition to that, we have the actor level. <coughs> so um, there are um, a lot of wildlife crime groups that exist of um, um, rather fluid and flexible networks, disorganized, um, uh, opportunistic crime groups, individuals, that are active there, as well as big corporations, wildlife farms, wildlife um, business entities that actually use their um, corporate infrastructures to facilitate illegal wildlife trade. But we also have powerful, highly organized, um, sophisticated and disciplined organized crime networks involved in the illegal wildlife trade. Um, those, some of them use violence um, and, uh, and corruption to facilitate and control the illegal trade in wildlife. And actually what we see in recent years is that there is a trend in diversification of organized crime groups involved increasingly in the illegal trade in natural resources in general, including the illegal trade in wildlife. And to understand in a bit better way how this works, I would like to briefly touch upon this uh, uh, theoretical model that looks at the different stages of diversification of organized crime into the illegal wildlife trade. 
if we see in the first stage of the environmental crime continuum, um, there are alliances being established between an organized crime group that is uh, active in a specific territory and an illegal wildlife uh, crime group. For example, um, in Colombia, there is an, an active ring um, in uh, bird smuggling, and they have to get these birds through the territory of an organized crime group that is there in charge. So what do they need to do? They need to establish somehow a sort of relationship with the organized crime group to pay at least the tax to them. This is, I would say, the first step in diversification, where the first contact can be seen with organized crime on a very low level and their role involved in illegal wildlife trade. In the second stage, we have a long-standing long -standing relationship. So those two parties actually establish a relationship, have mutual benefits, but also mutual enemies. Um, they have sometimes formal agreements about the trade that is, for example, going through the territory where organized crime groups are active. In the third stage, um, the two entities form actually one single entity. So they converge in the middle of the environmental crime continuum into an entity that displays characteristics of both groups or more groups simultaneously. So this means that we are talking here in the middle of the continuum about multifaceted, um, complex crime groups with a, a diverse criminal portfolio. So they have multiple trade lines, including illegal wildlife, illegal drugs, illegal wildlife, um, illegal drugs, illegal weapons, they kind of illegal commodities that are under their control. Another stage is transformation, where an organized crime group decides to be focused specifically on the illegal trade in wildlife, for example, coming from the drug trade. And in this particular stage, you see that they adapt to changing circumstances. Uh, for example, that can be politically in terms of repressive drug policies, but it can also be because of economic purposes that a particular timber species or a particular wildlife species reaches an extremely high level on the black market, or that the knowledge about those species, where the organized crime group is active, that the knowledge about the value is coming to the, uh, to the group, so that they actually transform their entire organization, like a legitimate business entity. In the final stage, we are talking about domination. This is a more traditional perspective on organized crime, where they are completely in control of a specific stage of the illegal wildlife trade. It can be the poaching part, can be the smuggling part, but can also be the distribution part. But the diversification of a crime group um, X uh, into a new market, Y, also um, is very often combined with um, established um, relationships established with local opportunistic networks. So a crime group from abroad can appear in a specific region, um, include a new illegal commodity in its criminal portfolio, but simultaneously has to work on their social relationships with the communities there and also with local opportunistic crime groups in the local setting. So what you see is that organized crime groups also actually outsource some of the illegal activities to local groups, for example, in terms of poaching or in terms of uh, uh, smuggling. So they establish a network around there to facilitate the illegal trade in wildlife in this sense. There are many concrete examples where organized crime groups are involved or become increasingly involved. Um, I did research in several parts of the world for my PhD in uh, China, Russia, and Morocco. And for my current research, um, I'm doing field work and research in Colombia and Panama, but also Southeast Asia, the border of Laos, Myanmar, and Thailand, but also in Eastern Congo. And um, based on this research, you see that Chinese organized crime groups increasingly become involved in illegal wildlife trade in neighboring countries, including Laos and Myanmar. Um, so they establish actually networks there and arrange that in, in particular tiger products, but also rhino for horn, um, is being smuggled across the border into China. Um, during my PhD, I also did research on the caviar trade in, um, in Russia. Uh, where you see that actually quite sophisticated networks of corrupt officials collaborate with um, Russian organized 
crime um, uh, structures to facilitate the illegal wildlife trade, in particular in uh, the source area of Dagestan. Um, in Colombia, I'm just two, two days back from Colombia, from field work there, and there you see that, um, well, one of the main uh, dominant uh, organized crime groups at the moment there is the so-called Golf Clan, they have names as well. But you see that in some of their territories where they are active, including Darien, the border area between Colombia and Panama, where they have territory of control, is that they also facilitate actually their smuggling routes to illegal wildlife traffickers that are interested to smuggle, for example, birds or uh, monkeys through their territory. So they facilitate illegal business there. In Europe, we've seen in recent years, of course, also some cases about rather organized groups, um, including um, Irish travelers that were um, robbing museums in Europe uh, from rhino horns, but also um, entered and knocked the door um, of, uh, of private owners of rhino horns to get the rhino horn, sometimes with violent activity. Uh, Congolese militia groups, so in eastern Congo, you see that there are a lot of militia groups actually vying for control over land, but also vying for control of natural resources, including illegal wildlife trade. So you see, for example, that the famous um, um, Rwanda, uh, originating from Rwanda, FDLR, a militia group, uh, has a very powerful position in the famous Virunga National Park in the southern sector, mainly um, known for their business in relation to charcoal trade. They completely control the charcoal trade there. But also you see that they take a part in the ivory business um, uh, to Chinese networks uh, based in Uganda. And finally, recently we see also that Mexican drug cartels actually diversify into illegal wildlife trade, into the trade of the Toto Aba. So these are examples, recent examples of organized crime groups that are involved in the illegal wildlife trade. But how do they converge? Where are links and why do they converge with other forms of crime? First, um, um, Tanya um, Wyatt and uh, Nigel Saad and, and me were working on an article about the relationship to wildlife trade and drug trade. And I think the concepts that we use in this article are in particular useful to illustrate how those two forms of illegal activities actually come uh, together. In the first place, with multiple trade lines. So if I told you, it, as I told you before, like the multifaceted um, uh, hybrid uh, crime groups that have a diverse uh, criminal portfolio, um, is visible here. For example, in, um, um, in, in the Golden Triangle area, where you see the Golden Triangle area is mainly known for the opium business in the past, and um, apparently also um, in relation to methamphetamine. So you see that a lot is going on in the context of a drug local political economy. And the money coming from those investors, some of the money is also invested in illegal wildlife trade. Sometimes the groups that are involved in the tiger skin business do it as a sideline. So they have as main focus the illegal drug business, but as a sideline they also deal in tiger skins because they need a high, um, a number, a high amount of money to invest in it. But it can also be that some of the uh, structures are actually using a diverse uh, um, a smuggling pattern. Um, there are concrete examples, for example, being mentioned during my field work, but also based on court files, that some of the groups actually smuggle one day illegal drugs like methamphetamine into China from Myanmar and the, day, the next day they smuggle tiger uh, products such as tiger skins or uh, tiger bomb wines into China with the same infrastructures. Second combined contraband um, is sometimes that something that happens of course in terms of convenience for the crime groups involved but also um, because uh, it can um, it can be a more direct way to, to get both um, illegal commodities transported simultaneously. There are several examples of this <coughs> in, um, in the border area of Panama and Colombia, for example. You see that coca is being transported along with tropical timber tr uh, uh, trunks. Uh, but there are also examples, for example, from the caviar study, where caviar together with weapons are transported from Dagestan to other regions in Russia. Camouflage is another aspect. That is actually something you might very well know about 
drug uh, cartels or drugs organizations like the Italian Mafia, the Comora, that actually use fishing vessels to import um, cocaine. Cocaine is hidden um, within fish. Uh, and sometimes the camouflage is also an illegal commodity, um, such as charcoal um, uh, in Eastern Congo being used as a cover to hide the ivory from Eastern Congo into Uganda. Barter trade to, to entirely um, avoid the financial system, avoid taxes, etc., etc. It can also be that products are uh, exchanged, in particular when we're talking about regions where they have not so much money. So when actually it's easier to, to barter products instead of paying for it. So there are examples where um, in the past where birds were exchanged for heroin, uh, but also um, in relation to ivory, that ivory is being exchanged for weapons for militia groups in Eastern Congo. Laundering money, um, there are also some wildlife um, uh, corporations that have a wildlife corporation or business entity as a cover to launder profits coming from illegal other uh, crimes, including the drug trade. For example, there are some examples there in Miami where you see that um, famous wildlife traders use their wildlife company as a sort of uh, yeah, um, uh, cover for uh, laundering illegal, um, illegal money. And finally also smuggling routes and transport methods. Um, well, if you look at the Colombian setting, you see, for example, that um, a lot of illegal migrants are going from Colombia into Panama, but also illegal weapons are being traded, um, as well as coca, of course, and that's exactly the same rivers, for example, the Cacarica River in Colombia, are being also used for the illegal trade in tropical timber or the illegal wildlife trade. So this is how you see how crimes actually converge. But this also has to do, of course, with, um, with criminogenic asymmetries in our globalized world. So um, at the moment, our world is, is changing rapidly. But if we look back at our world 20 years ago, there were the infrastructures and the communication methods were quite underdeveloped as how we know it uh, as today. So that means that also illegal entrepreneurs benefit at the moment from economic asymmetries, political asymmetries, cultural asymmetries between countries to facilitate um, their illegal uh, wildlife trade. To give you an example, um, economic um, asymmetries between, for example, getting a species from the jungle outside the jungle, um, where rhino horn, as you know, um, uh, is a lot of money at the black market at the moment, but also can attract groups to establish new alliances. Socioeconomic and geopolitical, but also ecological context are also really important. If we look at the origin of a lot of wildlife species, is that they are coming from biodiversity hotspots. In such biodiversity hotspots, there's generally not a real active governance presence there. Simultaneously, you see that the levels of corruption are often extremely high. And there is also an extremely high level of poverty. So such re regions are actually um, perfect breeding grounds for organized crime groups. And for that reason, you see this with cocaine, but you also see with other forms of crime, that such regions are also targeted by illegal groups to conduct their illegal activities. Um, criminal infrastructure being used by crime groups, so they have already the criminal infrastructure, and they can use this criminal infrastructure to flow illegal commodities along the way, to use the same corrupt officials, to use the same transport methods, or from wildlife. They have this established for wildlife and then are going to do it from, with drugs, so they diversify from wildlife into drugs, or from drugs into wildlife, or from weapons into wildlife. So these are all opportunities in their criminal um, infrastructure. Violence and intimidation are important notions being mentioned in relation to organized crime activities in general. You don't see them in all the cases of wildlife trafficking, but in some situations they are very, uh, very obvious there. In particular, when we are talking about um, groups vying over control, for example, in the Caspian Sea to get caviar trade, there are uh, poaching groups that are fighting with each other from Russia, from Kazakhstan, 
but also the Russian groups with, um, with Azerbaijan, uh, but also in relation to timber. Um, on the one hand, you see that, uh, for example, in the Colombian Darien, that local communities benefit also from organized crime structures in the area because they provide some level of security, they provide some level of economic resources, but simultaneously for other communities in those areas is being seen as a threat. So there are indigenous communities that are making a stance, try to fight back against organized crime structures that actually restrict their movements, recruit, recruit young people from their communities to get involved. Um, and that, I think, reflects quite well also the social harms that are related to organized crime involved activities. Final one is the local political economy. So on a local context, how do the people look at such um, illegal wildlife industries? Most of the time they are not considered as real, really criminal or really harmful. They are seen as gray areas, uh, gray areas of business. Um, it's socially accepted. Um, and therefore it's also quite difficult to change this. So you need awareness about the, the harms. You need the local people besides um, uh, the decisions that are being made. So to conclude, uh, biodiversity, scarcity, and value of wildlife play an important role um, in, in understanding the effects, but also the attractiveness for organized crime groups in the near future. I think in a rapidly changing world where social norms and values are changing, is that on an international level you see that there's more attention towards environmental issues. So this also will mean that in the near future, most likely, the illegal wildlife trade, including timber trade and animal trade, will be a more criminalized business. And that also means that corporations involved, um, small opportunistic crime structures have to make a decision. Would they like to continue in this business? Or do they stop because it becomes an undesirable um, harmful illegal uh, trade or it becomes criminalized by strong uh, sentences. On the other hand, there will also be new dynamics in terms of organized crime structures. Um, organized crime can become more active because of a criminalized business. Well, I see based on my field work on the borderlands of Laos with uh, China and Myanmar with China is that already now some drug smuggling networks are being used to smuggle illegal wildlife across the border. And that may increase in the near future if law enforcement is more strict, the penalties are higher, uh, but also if wildlife trade become more criminalized, which will happen, I believe, anyway. Diversification and crime convergence are important in tackling wildlife trade. In many places, it's not only about wildlife, it's also about convergences with other crimes or convergences with other uh, problems that uh, local people face. Um, and there the social construction of serious harm is really important. Uh, how and why is some, something socially accepted or some, something a socially undesirable form of crime? And that makes sense if we are talking about animals, but also if we're talking about deforestation. Local communities can need this entirely, can be totally dependent on organized crime networks involved in their territory. So how to deal with such issues by fighting simultaneously illegal wildlife trafficking needs to be a critical, very critical thought in terms of the solutions. And the final point is what is the role of the fourth protocol to the, uh, to the UNTAC? Um, I think um, that based on, um, yeah, on, on experiences with the UNTAC, um, we could say, well, it may, might have a deterrent effect. Um, but most importantly would be that the symbolic value of the UNTOC that is being considered as a serious crime, something that we as a new generation uh, do not accept anymore. That we say, well, we have to take action to protect species in our world, to protect ecosystems, but also to protect local livelihoods that are disturbed by uh, organized crime groups. Thank you so much for... Uh, um, my name is Daniel. Um, I work for a US-based non-profit law firm called Seizure of the Legal. Uh, I'm very grateful to um, Dr. Wyatt and the Global Initiative to be able to give a presentation here. Um, and as John already announced earlier, and um, as you can see from the title, 
Um, when the protocol came out, uh, when the, the uh, N Wildlife Prime Initiative it, it developed the draft protocol, uh, what we did is we had a look at it and we said, well, how would it apply to marine species? Is there anything in particular in drafting this protocol going forward, which we fully acknowledge is in the hands of member states, as John also said, um, that would make it a practical tool for combating IUU fishing? Um, and that would make it applicable to marine species. Um, so, I think all of us are aware IUU fishing is a big threat. Um, so, both uh, Tanya and John alluded to economic uh, impact of uh, illegal wildlife crime um, and illegal wildlife trade. Uh, for IUU fishing, there are some estimates, although they, they have their difficulties. Um, in 2017, the World Bank estimated uh, the value of illegal fishing at 11 to 36 billion US dollars. Um, and in a 2020 estimate puts the revenue um, just of the trade, uh, so that, that part of, in, uh, of illegal fishing that is afterwards traded, at 9 to 17 billion US dollars. Um, and there is no great definition of IU fishing, which is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to estimate it. But when you look at the FAO uh, International Plan of Action on IUU Fishing, uh, you notice that all of the activities that are classified as IUU Fishing under that international plan, in some form, fall outside of established management frameworks. And in, in that sense, they um, are either um, they're damaging existing management, or they're out completely outside of existing management, and are, at the very least, they're unfavorable. Um, IUU fishing also includes a number of fishing uh, methods that are um, that have an outsized environmental impact or that target particularly uh, vulnerable species. Um, and um, while they're not all illegal, they all have some form of negative impact on the marine environment. So it's important, however, to say to, to state very clearly, not all IUU fishing by definition is illegal. It's illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Um, and that um, if it is, which one of these three letters apply usually depends on national legislation. Um, so the actors behind illegal fishing are highly organized and professional. Uh, they operate across multiple jurisdictions, um, and as we all know here um, in Vienna, that uh, countering these transnational organized crime activities requires international cooperation. Um, several relevant agreements exist. I think in the interest of time, I will not go into a lot of detail in those. Just to name a few, of course, UNTOG is the principal global legal instrument to promote cooperation uh, to prevent and combat the scourge of transnational organized crime. Um, CITES has also been mentioned, it's almost the opposite, it has, has a mandate to regulate international trade in endangered species, but uh, it does not have a direct mandate to address wildlife crime, but has sort of arisen as a forum in which a lot, a lot of that work has happened, in particular through IQIC, which many of you will be aware of, the International Consortium on Combat and Wildlife Crime. Um, last but not least, specific to marine, we have the 2016 FAO Pool Savings Agreement, um, which is a first binding instrument specifically targeting IUU fishing. It's very much focused on port activities. Um, its potential is great, but effectiveness varies. Uh, ratification is very different in different regions of the world, and it works best when a lot of countries in a region have signed up to it. Um, and and we, in our view, it will always benefit from complementary approaches that don't just rely on what is happening at port, but that also look at what is happening at sea. Um, the proposed protocol for UNTOC presents an opportunity to do just that, um, to extend the applicability of UNTOC to a broader range of IUU fishing activities um, and close some gaps in current frameworks. Um, and so I will point out a few sort of key drafting decisions that were made in, in the initial draft that we initially put forward um, that make it applicable to IUU fishing. Um, and it's we fully recognize it's up to member states to decide how the protocol will be adopted um, and whether to adopt such a protocol. Um, so first, as John mentioned, um, fish are very often 
uh, forgotten component when, when talking about is it about that trade or about wildlife overall. Um, in some countries, um, there's a great paper by, by Dr. Wyatt on this, um, it, it, they're not even considered wildlife in the national legislation. Um, so it's all the more noteworthy that in footnote 20 of the draft article here, it's, it's clear that um, the, the term wild fauna and flora includes fish. Uh, and of course, maintaining that would be an important prerequisite in order to be able to apply the protocol to, to fishing um, uh, um, violations. Now, the second is that in the definition of trafficking in Article 3, um, introduction from the sea is included. Introduction from the sea is a term that comes from CITES, um, and it's one of the four transactions defined as international trade in Article 1 of CITES. Um, and it, it refers to the transportation of specimens from the high seas to a state. Um, it's been in the convention since it was adopted in 1973, but it wasn't really uh, put into practice until much later um, at the CITES COP16 uh, in 2013. Uh, for the first time, a number of, of uh, commercial relevant uh, species that were caught in the high seas were added to the size appendices, and, and it, together with that, CITES parties had to somehow operationalize introduction from the sea. Um, and, um, and so the way that it, it looks uh, in that resolution is, um, is a bit, yeah, don't, don't, don't be scared. It's, it's actually much easier than it looks. Um, so the usual transactions on the CITES are handled as, as import-export. It, it, CITES triggers as soon as a, a listed specimen crosses from one country to the next, and these, this is an import-export transaction. So, so before introduction from the sea, just a normal case is, is up top. Um, uh, vessel from flag state A catches a specimen in, in, in the EZ, and then lands it in port state B. That's an import-export transaction, normal CITES permits. Um, and in order to make the sea as simple as possible for member states, um, the, the conference of the parties decided that they, they make every transaction that includes the high seas, that includes two states, to be applied in the same way as, as the first one. Just, you know, stick to treating this as an import-export. Um, with one addition, um, usually CITES, and I'll, I will get to that soon, usually CITES only takes into account uh, national legislation when assessing if if a trade is legal, um, but for um, transactions that involve the high seas, countries sh shall also take into account whether the applicable international legal frameworks are being uh, complied with. And so only the last uh, situation where it's a one-state transaction, one vessel goes out to the high seas and then comes back into the port of the same state, that is sort of the, 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 the strictest sense uh, introduction from the sea, and there's a special permitting way that. Um, so both of these scenarios um, fall under introduction from the sea, and because almost all fish, or almost all CITES listed fish, I should say, that are caught on the high seas fall under one of these scenarios because they have to be landed somewhere, it effectively expands CITES mandate to cover most high seas fishery scenarios. Um, for the species that are listed on the convention. As John said, um, that isn't, depend, depending on species group, that isn't a lot of species. Um, this protocol, of course, by using this term, would apply to a much wider range of species. Um, going to the next um, element, um, having established a very, potentially very broad scope there through including introduction sea and fish, um, the protocol can then support other mandates. So, so one big stumbling block in using CITES listings to um, support some other measures. So for instance, there's a, a convention called uh, Convention of Migratory Species, Bond Convention. Bond Convention Annex 1 requires parties um, to prohibit the take of species that are listed on that annex. However, the Bonn Convention doesn't have a history of being well implemented in international legislation. So when you look at the CITES trade database, there's a number of species that are on CMS Appendix 1 that are being 
being traded legally under CITES because CITES only requires you to look at the natural inflation. It doesn't require to look at whether or not that the country that is trading has signed up to another instrument that it hasn't implemented in national law. Um, and so um, the fact that the protocol here makes direct reference in Article 5 to um, applicable international law um, has, a, has a huge potential to help address sort of non-compliance with treaties that are not so well enforced um, and, and to um, basically create almost like these layers of, of mutual support between treaties. Um, and then uh, just to add some paragraph B of Article 5 gives port and transit states an additional legal basis to take action against vessels involved in IUU fishing um, or transport of specimens derived from IUU fishing. And as John mentioned, that is uh, it's, it's this comedy between states shifting some of the enforcement, board, uh, enforcement burden away from the source countries, which might often be poor coastal countries that don't have vessels um, in order to, to, to do uh, patrols to stop um, and inspect vessels, um, and to move it more to transit and destination countries and really sort of help out there. Um, now, just before concluding, a couple of uh, other issues that we found out uh, we found when we were analyzing the, the draft protocol. Um, of course, as many of you will know, Article 73.3 of UNCLOS um, places restrictions on corporal punishment by the coastal state for IUU fishing violations. Um, so there are uh, very specific situations that, that um, uh, would require some drafting around um, where the, this could be in conflict. Um, what's very helpful is that the protocol, um, as, as John also mentioned, would forgo Antos requirement that the crime must be punishable by four years in prison. Um, however, talking to, to some experts, and um, one of the things that we thought would be useful if parties then set out another way of prioritizing in order to not um, have to deal with you know, a whole lot of new um, uh, issues um, at, at the same time. So for example, one thing that was, uh, I think, um, proposed at the, at the first OC24 that GI Talk uh, organized was to look at, uh, for example, environmental damage as one of the criteria uh, for prioritization. Um, also, um, it's important to note that wildlife crime often has a very terrestrial focus in audience um, because of the, the history of the discussions. Um, the, the IUU fishing discussions almost sort of go in parallel very often. Um, FAO has a very strong mandate there, but of course in order for this to be of maximum use, um, the fishery sector needs to be aware, they need to be involved, um, it can't be sort of forced on them. Um, so I think it, it's, it's important um, in our view for, to involve, um, for example, FAO and others um, in this process going forward if member states decide to go forward. Um, so they feel some ownership and they can also see how to make the best use of that and how it can be supported of, of the tools that they have available. Um, and lastly, um, we know that, the, and Ian mentioned that, uh, the role of civil society um, in a lot of uh, these processes um, could be much more modern. Um, I think that the, that the, the reality of, of what civil society is doing in, uh, to, to combat wildlife crime, including uh, for marine species, has moved far beyond this sort of traditional awareness raising um, to providing a multitude of, of uh, services, assistance, and so on to member states uh, on their um, member states driven, of course, and, and on their demand, but still um, there, there could be a modernization of the roles that civil society play. Um, that, that could be recognized in the protocol. And um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions, happy to discuss. And thanks again for the opportunity.
Daniel, maybe this is a very quick uh, answer for you, but uh, you mentioned a draft protocol. And is there a draft traditional force protocol out there right now? Or was this your suggestion for an eventual draft protocol? Thanks. No, so um, on the M add a couple of uh, points to that. So we drafted a, a draft protocol uh, thinking that uh, states would want to at least have a, an idea of what that protocol could look like, but it's by no means something that's put forward by states. It's just something that um, an NG, um, a law firm, uh, Arnold Porter in New York, kindly worked with us pro bono, and they helped us provide interested states uh, an idea of what this protocol could look like and what the provisions in, the, in it could, you know, um, could be useful for. So what Daniel uh, Gorton did here is he took some of these provisions and analyzed them and he sort of uh, um, yeah, discussed the, the pros and cons of that protocol. But we are very happy to share that draft with you. It's available on our website, um, and wildcrime.org. And uh, again, that's just really an idea of what we think the protocol could look like, but it's up to states to decide what they want and don't want in that protocol. So again, very informal instrument so far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is my home in Northeast England and we're out for a walk and he's standing on the drop off. Sorry, go on, please, what's your question? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Magnus Pardino. I work at the EU delegation in Vienna. Um, and I followed the discussion on violent crimes uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so, for, well, first of all, I would like to thank you for the organization of this uh, round table uh, on a very uh, complex uh, topical issues and uh, urgent issues. Uh, and thank you also for the pedagogical also approach of your presentation so far, so thank you so much. Um, you know the position of the EU concerning uh, the preservation of, of, of nature environment, you know about the Green Deal, so we, are, uh, we want to, to, to be ambitious on what uh, we need to do, both in, in the EU but also outside the EU. Um, you, are, you may have heard the presentation of the uh, proposal for EU, uh, EU uh, directive uh, on environment crime uh, two weeks ago. So we are very ambitious uh, on this uh, on this issue. Uh, but as you all of you have mentioned the complexity of the issue, uh, you may know that all uh, all states may not have the same approach uh, to, to to the subject. I mean, in terms of intent, the intent to, to do more it, it might be there. But in terms of concrete measures that we can take, it might be more, more difficult. Uh, maybe you have heard uh, what the Guatemala said, uh, the, delegate, the delegate from Guatemala said at the environment uh, climate thematic discussion. He said that uh, to go for more prosecution, it might be a problem for poor co countries and poor regions, specifically, specifically rural regions where people are poor. So cutting, he said, uh, cutting a, a tree uh, in a rural um, area where poor people live and they have to, I mean, they have to survive, or cutting a tree in, a, in, in Brussels, I mean, it, it's not the same impact and it's the same uh, uh, issue. So, um, so the, he mentioned that maybe instead of doing more on prosecution, we should do on criminalization, we should do more on, on raising awareness and uh, on, on prevention. Um, and so this is one point. The second point w uh, was that um, you may also have heard that uh, the woman from UNODC that made a, made a presentation on UNTOC uh, uh, at the session, she mentioned that actually the UNTOC convention already allows for a more criminalization of, of, this, uh, of this issue. So I wonder if you have uh, had contact with, I guess that you have contact with UNODC, so how do you uh, you, you see also the reception of this question by UNODC. Um, and, uh, but I understand also what you say that uh, having, um, I mean, what, what's the point to, to have a new protocol if we, have, if we need to, to, to have one, if it's not applied at the end? We know the problem of implementation of uh, UNTOC. I understand the point of deterrent uh, effect, uh, but uh, maybe it's not enough. Uh, add a couple of uh, points 
to that. So you mentioned how Guatemala uh, rightly raised the point that you know cutting a tree in a poor country is not the same thing as cutting a forest or any any uh, tree in a in a rich country, and that's correct. And I think that's what the protocol is also really useful for, because the idea is that yes, you could activate Yoon talk by uh, making environmental crimes and wildlife crimes uh, a serious crime, right? But that would entail 40 years of imprisonment. And I think what this protocol has the benefit of um, providing is a, a different solution. So you don't actually need those four years of imprisonment. You could negotiate different penalties that are lower than four years, and that could be administrative penalties, could be uh, you know um, fines and other other types of penalties that would have that um, you know mind uh, well you know that in mind the idea that you don't need to punish everything in the same way and not all wildlife crime is the same. So I think what John would say, and he might want to add something to that, he's still online, um, it's exactly this, that we don't want to treat everything in the same way. Um, and regarding the idea of, well, do we really need another instrument? I think what we, what we know is that we really just want to have, we only have one instrument here, and it's CITES. And CITES, as John said, only protects 0.5% of species out of 8 million. So the idea is, yes, we do have an instrument, but it's not enough, and it's, uh, it, it's never, it, it was never meant to be a crime instrument. That is for UN conventions in Vienna to deal with. And so we do have a legal framework, it's not enough, and it was never meant to be enough. And I think it's for international law and the UN here in Vienna to be ambitious about what international law can do. And you know we can we can keep saying that uh, another instrument is is just going to be another instrument, or we can think that by providing a better improved legal framework internationally, we can harmonize national law and provide those different penalties for different situations. So um, I, I, one last thing that maybe the uh, delegation from Angola would like to address is that at this first stage, what the resolution that Agala will put forward is not a, a resolution to start a negotiation here. We're starting a discussion, and I think that's the important part. We want to make sure that UNODC and states put forward you know, their view, and they analyze the issue and say what the benefits could be or what the benefits could not be. So at this stage, what we're really trying to do is start a conversation uh, with Angola's resolution that will come in May, and I think that's really an opportunity for states to explore this issue at a different level. Because so far we have, you know, small rooms with small budgets, and uh, you know, some of the players are interested. But how about we have a resolution that everyone gets behind, and we start that institutional conversation at a higher level, and then we decide if you talk could be improved, and if a fourth protocol is worth having. Um, so again, I'm just repeating, I think, what, we, what John would say, but uh, if he's online, he might want to add something to that. Yeah, I would just quickly say you asked about UNODC, and um, I've been in conversation with them, and they're uh, just neutral about, since they are, um, I'm going to miss the terminology, are they the are they overlords? No. Custodian. 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 That they're not taking a position on, on Yeah, thanks, Tanya, and uh, thanks for the question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, thanks. Yes, we have uh, briefed uh, UNODC, we briefed the Executive Director, Ms. Dana Wally, and staff about um, the protocol and the call made by the President of Angola, Costa Rica, Gabon, and Malawi. Um, as Tanya said, they are uh, member state led, so they will take the lead from member states. So they won't express quite properly any view for or against at this point in time. If called upon, uh, and the resolution that would come forward by Angola would uh, also call upon UNODC to express itself, uh, then it will, uh, in response to member states, uh, express a view. Um, I was there in the room and I heard Guatemala made that intervention. And if I heard correctly, the example given of, of illegal, illegally taking a tree. That would be a matter that I don't think would trouble the UN Crime Commission, uh, the UNCTOC, or this protocol. If it's a, 
local subsistence issue that ought to be dealt with locally. Um, what we are talking about here is transnational organised crime that's occurring at an industrial scale um, that is having all of the consequences that Tanya referred to. The other thing is with um, the UNCTOP, as has been mentioned, you have to have four years imprisonment or, or more to trigger it. What we are looking for is a much wider suite of available penalties. The protocol would trigger the UNCTOP, it would trigger the review mechanism, but you wouldn't be obliged to have a custodial sentence of four years or more for everything that may constitute wildlife crime. And it opens the space for a much broader range of penalties based on the scale, nature and consequences of the environmental harm caused. So from community service orders, to a fine, to damages, to restitution, then possibly incarceration as well. But it opens up a much broader and I'd say more sophisticated approach to how you uh, address penalties. In terms of the protocol, and uh, as Alice said, we, we had one drafted with a, with a group. It's just a first draft. Uh, it was drafted to assist states contemplate what, what could be uh, considered. It is by no means complete. As I said in my uh, presentation, there are a number of elements that we've identified. I, I, I laid them out, but others have already said they'd like to see other things included there should the protocol go forward. We also heard, and we often hear people say, yeah, but this, the UNCTOP hasn't worked that well, or the protocols haven't all been implemented. Well, I, I just invite you to look at international law more generally. The Convention on Biological Diversity failed to reach its 2010 and 2020 targets. Do we say let's not keep going with the Convention on Biological Diversity because it failed to meet its targets? The Convention on International uh, Wetlands uh, we've lost something like 80% of wetlands, 90% of wetlands. Can we say, well, let's not keep going with that because we've lost too many? Climate change convention. We're not meeting the objectives of climate change. Do we give that one away as well? Um, you know, I can tell you, we can all go through a raft of examples of where we haven't lived up to our aspirations that we've set out or our commitments or obligations in international law. But if we think it's worth doing and if we think the issue is important enough, we give expression to it in international law, and it gives us an anchor, it gives us a focal point. This is what we'd like to do. This is what we want to achieve. Even though we know we're not always going to get there, it's, it's where we want to be. The Biodiversity Convention will have targets for 2030, after failing 2010, 2020. We need to persist, and I would say, while the UNCLOP hasn't been perfect, it is the instrument we have. We need to make it work. And this protocol is badly needed if we are actually going to turn around the scale and nature of these horrendous wildlife crimes. The current system is not going to get us across the line, that is for sure. Do we want to scale this up? And it's certainly something we've fed into the process on the EU directive, um, and we've also very much appreciated, and I certainly did when I was with CITES, appreciated the great support of the EU in uh, dedicated to ICAN, uh, which is fantastic. So, thank you very much. Very happy to introduce my colleague, Dr. Angus Nurse, who is at the Nottingham Trent University in the UK. Um, and as you can see there, he's the head of criminology and criminal justice there. He's an acad his academic work focuses on wildlife law, um, and he does have a new book out too about corporate environmental crime, which looks like a must read. And not only is he a successful academic, but he's serving as co-chair of the Wildlife Law Working Group of the UK Center for Animal Law. But Angus was also a local investigator uh, for government in the UK and uh, an investigator also for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. So he has this uh, very useful and interesting mixed background of, uh, of academia as well as practical experience. And as a legal scholar, uh, as well as a criminologist, uh, he will talk to us today about international approaches to protecting wildlife. So, Angus, over to you. Hello, um, I'm Angus Nurse. I'm head of the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Nottingham Trent University in the UK. And um, sorry, I can't be with you today. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. Uh, I'm going to pick up on raised by some of the uh, earlier speakers, particularly in relation to uh, international mechanisms relating to, to dealing with wildlife crime, 
and also the, uh, the the key point I think John made about the fact that wildlife crime is largely absent from international criminal law, but there are mechanisms that can be used to kind of bring it within that remit. So uh, about uh, two years ago now, uh, Tanya and I worked on a book on wildlife criminology. And uh, again, it relates to one of the points that I think John made earlier on uh, around the definitions of wildlife crime being quite, quite varied. Uh, for the purposes of our work, we did include fish, we did include um, plants and trees, and came up with this definition uh, of what we considered wildlife crime to be. So it's beyond just trafficking, although uh, I will come back to trafficking, and identify this issue of, for an act to be considered a wildlife crime, has to be something that's uh, specified as such by legislation, has to be an act committed against or involving wildlife, and the broad definition of wildlife is uh, confirmed there, including plants or trees which, uh, wildlife which forms part of a country's natural environment or is of a species which is a uh, visitor in a wild state, and should involve an offender. Uh, that could be an individual, a corporation, or indeed the state. And the notion of state crime is kind of integral or state corporate crime. It's linked to some of the points I'm going to make uh, later on. In this regard, we're not just looking at an unlawful act, but also looking at broader breaches of obligations towards wildlife. And they become quite important when you look at some of the mechanisms that can be used in order to address wildlife issues under international law. Now, in addition to the notion of wildlife being absent from um, international criminal law, or wildlife crime being absent from international criminal law, um, there is a point to consider in relation to the fact that most wildlife legislation, certainly that I've looked at, is distinctly not criminal. It's not designed as criminal law. It's not necessarily conceptualised as in criminal law. Um, but what it does is it contains a number of things that then give us some of the offences that we might look at in relation to things like wildlife trafficking. Uh, but in a, in a broad sense, what wildlife law does and what international wildlife law does is um, allows for control of wildlife. So killing and management of wildlife can be distinctly legal uh, where it's carried out in order to ensure that wildlife um, does not interfere unduly with human interests. It allows for ex exploitation of wildlife, uh, particularly as a valuable natural asset, and this will include things like um, poaching, um, not poaching, sorry, uh, trophy hunting, uh, and other sort of trade in wildlife. Um, it does protect uh, wildlife, but this is usually in the context of prohibition of acts which harm individual animals beyond the permitted level. So in looking at wildlife law, and I appreciate I'm probably preaching to a, an audience that understands this quite well, um, often it is the prohibition of certain acts which give rise to the problem rather than the trade per se. Um, and then there's a conservation element implementing other public good and wildlife trust doctrines. This is uh, important and relevant when we consider some of the international law provisions that do provide for um, the protection of wildlife and create some of our offences. Um, I had a couple of slides concerning CITES, which I took out since that's been covered in previous discussion. Um, but it is important to note the, the points made by other people about the fact that CITES is, um, not, is not by itself criminal law. It requires implementation and the creation of offences by, by member states. It does signal some of the issues in terms of acts that should be considered to be unlawful and that should attract a sanction. Uh, but essentially, it's not really criminal law. And there are certainly good reasons for retaining CITES. Uh, but if it's going to be intended as something that will be dealt with as, as kind of specifically criminal law, arguably it requires some kind of modification. Uh, one of the previous speakers also mentioned the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals, which is another international mechanism intended to protect um, wild animals of a migratory nature during their range. Um, the International Whaling Convention um, 
is also an international law measure that uh, contains provisions relating to or is implemented in a way that means that uh, illegal taking of whale citations and so on can be problematic. Uh, we have European Union wildlife trade laws. Um, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption um, arguably could be used in circumstances where corruption, where poaching is linked to corruption. Uh, but generally speaking, we're looking at the application of international law through domestic law, and so the extent to which it is um, implemented, but also the extent to which it is enforced, can be problematic. However, in looking at this at the international level, um, there is scope to consider some of the actions of international courts and some of the enforcement action that they may carry out. Here, I'm going to talk briefly about the International Criminal Court uh, and the International Court of Justice, and uh, wrap up with a few points around how we might look at international law as being something that can be used um, in order to engage with some of the problems of wildlife destruction, uh, if not wildlife trafficking. Now, before the break, there was a little bit of a discussion about the extent to which we have some of these mechanisms um, in international law, but they're not necessarily successful. Part of that might be an issue of enforcement, which may be something that we address during the discussion session. Um, but part of it is an, is an aspect of um, how things are conceptualised. As John said, uh, wildlife law, uh, sorry, wildlife crime is not really considered to be um, something that's considered by international criminal law. And within the remit of international criminal law, probably the main thing we tend to talk about is the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which is concerned with the most serious crimes of concern to the international community. Um, and that sets out uh, the following as international crimes. War crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, aggression, uh, which is really one state or country attacking or threatening another, and uh, kind of torture as an issue. Um, and these are things that are seen as having a, if you like, a, a kind of human rights aspect to it, violating the rights of the individual, threatening international peace and security, and threatening the rules of international law. There have been attempts to um, add major environmental damage to the, the, the Rome Statute through um, the creation of a, an, an additional uh, crime against peace, which uh, could be framed as ecocide. That hasn't been successful. However, there is potential for wildlife crime and, and, and environmental crime that incorporates wildlife crime to be incorporated within some things that the ICC might consider. Um, so wildlife crime is absent from the, the ICC's jurisdiction and the, the definitions of international crime. However, 2016, uh, the International Criminal Court did issue a policy paper saying that environmental crimes committed in the context of crimes regulated by the Rome Statute would be prosecuted. Um, we have a little piece of work going on at the moment to de de determine whether or not that's actually happened, because I don't think it has. However, um, what it means is that potentially where wildlife or environmental crime takes place as part of another activity that's already covered by the Roman statute, then potentially it is something that um, the ICC could look at. Um, so potentially in relation to a war crime or a crime of aggression, uh, the word potentially is doing a lot of heavy lifting there, uh, it's, there's potential for the destruction of wildlife carried out as part of that activity and, and as part of a systematic process um, that meets the standard of gravity required by the ICC could be considered alongside the other things. Although, um, given the, the clear absence, arguably what the Rome Statute requires is amending to clearly incorporate uh, wildlife trafficking or certain types of wildlife crime as a specific type of crime. Now, the enforcement of international wildlife law um, is perhaps 
the bigger issue rather than the content of international um, laws, because in looking at some of the content of international laws, uh, some of them are actually quite good, although again, as uh, was mentioned by one of the speakers before the break, it's the enforcement that is problematic, and there are a number of international conventions and, and uh, international wildlife law measures which are not um, rigorously enforced. Part of the, fact, the reason for that is the fact that it largely remains in the hands of state agencies. It's an issue of state sovereignty, so states can perhaps decide how rigorously they are going to look at things. And compliance is predicated on a whole range of structural and non-compliance measures which aren't necessarily enforced particularly rigorously. So that um, where breaches of international wildlife protection um, is something that's done at a state level, and perhaps in, in conjunction with the notion of states and corporations allowing things to happen, it requires international action to resolve, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, the problem with the sanctions tend to be seen as advisory, and perhaps that's something to consider in relation to the UNTOC protocol that we're talking about um, today. The extent to which there will be meaningful sanctions if we do, if something is introduced. As uh, John said in, in his answer to the question, the fact that there may be difficulties isn't, a, isn't necessarily a reason for not doing it, but it is worth thinking about how things are enforced. Now, um, the second international mechanism to consider here, and these, these are not the only ones, but, but it's also the work of the International Court of Justice, which could arguably adjudicate on some international wildlife law matters that have been enacted by the UN, um, and could consider cases that are brought by one state against another where harm has crossed state borders. So where a state is effectively failing in its international obligations, or the state itself is acting illegally, it does raise the possibility of action being taken at an international level. There is also scope for advisory opinions on whether there's been a breach of law. I've got two cases to just very quickly talk through. Um, first one relates to uh, whaling, which um, was a case brought by Australia in 2010. Uh, I believe there may be some Australians in the audience who might want to chip in on this when there are questions. Um, where Australia lodged a complaint with the International Court of Justice, effectively asking the court to conclude that Japanese whaling, uh, or the Japanese whaling program that was carried out in being carried out in accordance with scientific loophole um, that would allow this to happen, um, was actually anything but. It was not whaling carried out for the purposes of scientific research. So the court was being asked to look at uh, what was happening and to determine that the um, JAPA 2 scientific program was actually commercial whaling uh, and rather than scientific whaling. And if you cast your mind back to my first or second slide, this would meet our definition of a wildlife crime and a wildlife crime being uh, carried out by a state. So it was asked to make that judgment to determine that Japan had breached its obligations under CITES and the Convention on Biodiversity. And so you can see there that that brings in some of the international law mechanisms that we've already talked about and the obligation to comply with these. And it also asked that uh, there should be a declaration that Japan should cease to issue any further permits for scientific whaling, should revoke any of the existing permits, and basically should stop whaling program that was considered to be an unlawful activity. The court agreed um, and it concluded uh, essentially that Japan had to cease the program and revoke any of the authorizations that were still in place to allow people to license, to kill, take or treat whales under the JAPA 2 program and shouldn't grant any further permits under the program. Um, in reading the judgment it's clear that what the court did is that it effectively concluded that the evidence didn't establish um, the program as being scientific whaling, and so the ex exemption in the whaling convention could not be relied upon. Now, in relation to this case, um, first thing to, to mention is that obviously it required one state to consider that action was necessary against another, 
It's also worth pointing out that the judgment is quite specific in relation to the complaint that's been made. Um, the second case, to just for me to just mention very briefly here, uh, Costa Rica versus Nicaragua. Uh, this is, this is a, again a case that was brought to the International Court of Justice, and it was um, Costa Rica claiming that the Republic of Nicaragua was guilty of an unlawful incursion, occupation, and use of Costa Rican territory. And it included claims of serious damage to protected rainforests and wetlands. Now, earlier on, uh, Tanya raised the question of can we think of wildlife as a loss that somehow needs to be addressed? Now, although this case is about the environment, uh, it's about rainforests and wetlands, it does link to that notion that potentially compensation can be claimed for um, destruction and damage of. Uh, environmental natural resources. Um, here, Nicaragua responded with a counterclaim that Costa Rica had violated its sovereignty and had caused environmental harm through a road construction program in the border area. The International Court of Justice joined the two cases together and in 2015 it ruled that Nicaragua had committed what was considered to be an internationally wrongful act and so was ordered to pay reparations. Now, the issue around the compensation um, ended up in the case being proceeded a little bit further on. Um, but in 2018, the International Court of Justice ruled that, and this is a quote, Dam damage to the environment and the consequent impairment or loss of the ability of the environment to provide goods and services is compen sorry, that should be compensatable um, under international law. So, the loss of, uh, the, loss of the environment the loss of the environment to provide goods and services, uh, potentially looking at the loss of wildlife, which as we know in some states is exploited as a natural resource, um, which does provide goods and services, could potentially there raise some issues around um, the ability for states to bring compensation. Although again, the point here is about one state taking action against another. So, um, for me to briefly wrap up and leave time for questions. Um, in looking at some of the international mechanisms, some of the, uh, the core issue is that wildlife trafficking and international wildlife protection broadly remains outside of international criminal law. In principle, international provisions can be enforced via mechanisms such as the International Court of Justice but this relies on states being willing to tackle cases. Um, and we're doing a little bit of work at the moment in looking at the types of cases that have been brought and by whom, which probably has a political element to it. However, the enforcement of uh, these kinds of claims uh, is case specific and is based around the specific issues that are raised in the case and crucially, uh, it relates to the extent to which states are willing to abide by the judgments. So here we have wildlife uh, crime and wildlife laws being dealt with as an environmental issue rather than an international criminal law issue. And if we are going to move towards viewing wildlife um, issues specifically with the remit of criminal law and alongside the principles of criminal law, then arguably, arguably a mechanism like CITES requires redevelopment um, so that it becomes a preventative um, and punitive tool rather than one that, if you like, facilitates um, or rather regulates trade and then allows for uh, sanctions to be taken reliant on the state that implements the measures. Um, there is scope potentially to consider serious wildlife harm as an international crime within the remit of the ICC, uh, but that would probably require it to be done in the context of looking at other actions where it's carried on alongside that, um, but alongside the untold notion perhaps to consider the notion of where uh, cases might be taken to establish that this is the case. And I think my wrapping up point is that um, where wildlife trafficking is in, incorporated in something like a, an UNTOP protocol, um, 
one of the issues I think that um, requires quite a lot of looking at is how that is then enforced. I think Dan mentioned the, raised the question about whether or not uh, this was symbolic, and I think part of what um, I'm saying in this presentation is that even though it might be symbolic where it raises and can be linked with other obligations, there is scope to perhaps take action at an international level, as well as uh, enforcing the obligations that people have at a state level and revisions of state legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you to Dr. Nurse. Uh, if, if it's possible to go back to, to the beginning of the presentation, uh, the crimes uh, included in the ICC uh, statute, uh, because my question is directly related to that, please. Did you hear that, Angus? I didn't hear that very well, I'm afraid. Did we see the um, slide with the war crimes and all the other ICC crimes, please? Yeah, I think I... I suspect I don't know what one of the questions is going to be. There's something I should probably take off that slide, but just bear with me. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to retrospectively possibly remove the torture. Is that what you were going to say to you? <laughs> Cyber torture, but it's a different uh, realm. Yeah, but my question is, um, in any case, why trying to go through a war crime or a new category and not a crime against humanity? Given that the war crime has a very, it has to be a very deliberate act of aggression in a very specific context, some uh, wildlife crimes can be actually used as a war crime as a tool, but others are a crime against humanity per se. So mm -hmm. why, I, I was curious about that. Why following that avenue and not the crimes against humanity, which would be easier, especially given that it's not codified yet and it's more open in order to to fit this new understanding of, of the um, dimension of the crime. Yeah. Thank you. Did you hear that, Angus? I, I did hear that, and I should say, yeah, I'm, I'm not excluding crimes against humanity. I think one of the issues with crimes against humanity is around the, the kind of systematic nature of things uh, that falls within the definition of crime against humanity. Whereas, in fact, a war crime can be a single act. Uh, so even though it could be a single act committed as part of a large scale activity, um, and also I think in relation to aggression, uh, it, that potentially brings in something that Dan was talking about, the, uh, the role of militias and armed groups where they might be state sponsored and be involved in um, things that are um, relating to um, the destruction or the um, kind of trading in wildlife. I'm also thinking in terms of the fact of where we have militarized poaching, um, which particularly um, can certainly fit very clearly into some of the others. Uh, but I would agree, I'm not ruling out crimes against humanity. We're still looking at some of the, the material on crimes against humanity to see whether or not that would, that would work. Uh, but to me, I think aggression and war crimes fit more easily, particularly when you think about some of the, uh, the kind of militarized nature of wildlife, and when you, when you think about things, so let's take that again, the militarized nature of wildlife poaching, um, and also where, for example, um, you may have kind of um, uh, things around the killing of game wardens linked to some of those activities that clearly fit it within some of, which potentially fit it within some of those actions. Uh, less so in relation to crime against humanity, but I absolutely agree. I would, I would look at crimes against humanity as well. I think that one's tougher. Does anyone else have any questions to Angus or anything from the whole day? Between 
I think 2018, 2019, and now there was a standing committee process on introduction from the sea of thigh whale by Japan, and the Secretariat went the exact other way. It did not um, make any judgment about whether or not the, the, the whaling was scientific, but rather it focused specifically on are the right permits being issued, and are the specific provisions that are uh, tied to these permits being fulfilled, and in the end, um, uh, the, 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 the secretary presented two choices to the standing committee, and the standing committee judged that, um, the, that the, the, the provisions of non-commercial were not fulfilled, so it reached a similar conclusion, but it went very different ways in terms of argumentation. Oh, that's interesting, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I think the other thing, in case I didn't make this clear, is that um, the other issue about it is that, if you like, that case is, is almost kind of geographically specific. So it relates to the case called by Australia, but you couldn't apply the whole principle kind of internationally, I don't think, across different areas. So one of the, one of the potential challenges of using a couple of these, the, these two mechanisms, is you might have to take a series of individual cases in order to address a kind of more widespread um, wildlife issue. No, Tanya, I was just going to express my thanks to everyone who attended today and for the, for the excellent questions and interaction. I'm sorry I missed the coffee time, because that's when you always have the most interesting chats. Um, but also thanks to you, Tanya, for, for bringing it all together today. To Ian, um, I really enjoyed his presentation and all the presentations I enjoyed, including Angus's that we just heard. Uh, but thanks to all the presenters. And uh, we are available to take any further questions outside of this context. So Alice is there. She can provide our contact details, and we continue to lend uh, our full support uh, as requested to uh, Angola, Costa Rica, Gabon, and Malawi, and to any other state that may uh, choose to join uh, the call that uh, those four states have made. So thanks very much to you, and, and thanks to all. Thank you for all the participants online.